Hey, good, good morning, everybody. Thanks for being here today. I'm Darwin Brown, be the moderator for today's session. Uh, today's session, by the way, is quality improvement. What is your Q QIIQ, recognizing the importance of quality improvement in PA practice today? Our speakers are going to be Joyce Neiman and John Bowser, both from the University of Colorado Physician Assistant Program. Um, and we'll get to them in just a second. A couple other quick announcements we need to make before we get started. Um, as a convenience and a courtesy to our speakers, please silence your cell phones. At this point in time, would be certainly appreciated. There's no photographing or videotaping of this session except for that that's being done legally today. Uh, please, if you have questions at this, as the session goes on, there are microphones in the aisles. Please make sure you use those uh, for your questions today so they can be taped as well. When you leave, make sure you take your personal belongings and any trash you might have collected along the way um, in addition to that. Um, today, for this session and the sessions that will be held in this room, which are all sponsored by the Physician Assistant Educators Association, we'll be using the yellow evaluation forms, not the electronic form that AAPA has used for uh, its conference, but the good old-fashioned paper and pen sessions for, uh, or evaluation forms that you'll find at the ends of the uh, seats today. The session today that you're in is 01. So today's session is 01 for the evaluation. They'll collect those on the way out today as you go along. Also, the rest of the day, we have sessions in here that are sponsored by the PAEA uh, that will cover a host of topics. We're starting with, with uh, QI today. We'll be talking about uh, the value and benefits of being a preceptor, the fact that you can now just start uh, claiming Category 1 CME for uh, precepting of students, um, test-taking tips and working with students from that perspective, the clinician as a, um, as a teacher moving forward into the uh, academic world as well. So a host of different topics I think you'll find to be of great value to those of you who might be contemplating uh, a change into academia at some point. But without any further ado, please let me introduce and give a warm welcome to Washington, D.C. to both Joyce Neiman and John Bowser. Can you hear me all right? I tend to talk loud. Can you hear me? Great. This is Jonathan Bowser, and he's the program director for the University of Colorado Physician Assistant Program. And this is Joyce Neiman. She's an assistant professor and our clinical site coordinator at the University of Colorado PA program. And Joyce has recently returned to our faculty uh, after doing a sabbatical in quality improvement uh, out in, in Medicare practices in Colorado. Thanks. So good morning. Thank you for joining us for our talk on quality improvement and what's your QI IQ. So our goal today is to help increase your knowledge of quality improvement concepts and help explain to you why quality improvement should be thoughtfully integrated into your practices. So our goals when you walk away today are that you can discuss the relationship between quality improvement, patient safety, and healthcare reform, or healthcare reimbursement. Also, we hope that you can apply the new NCCPA requirements for performance improvement CME, and we hope you'll take away some tools and resources that you can use to implement quality improvement into your practice. And I must say, a little background on this talk John and I gave. Uh, like he said, I was in quality improvement for a year. I took a sabbatical away and worked on a CMS project on Adverse Drug Events Collaborative. I came back and shared with John my enthusiasm for this, and we both agreed that we can prepare our students well to manage disease and disease um, complications, but unless we prepare them to practice in an environment where there are medical errors and system shortcomings and where Physician, practitioner, and clinical scorecards are the norm. We're pretty much doing them a disservice. So with that, let's get started. So it's no secret that we have an expensive healthcare system, and I always like to show these, uh, these bar graphs uh, to demonstrate that we have the tallest bar on some of these graphs. And these are the sorts of graphs where you don't want to have the tallest bar. So in this particular graph, this is, a, um, this is older data from 2009, um, but this is healthcare spending per capita adjusted for cost of living. And these are some of the wealthy countries um, across the bottom here. Uh, and you'll notice that we have far and away the tallest bar. Uh, we're a very expensive uh, system for payers. Oops, thanks. <coughs> And then this is another one of those <clears throat> bar graphs where it's not desirable to be the tallest bar on the graph. And here we are again. Uh, all the way on the left is us, the United States. These are other wealthy uh, nations. And this, has, this is uh, the, the patient safety slide. Deaths due to surgical or medical mishaps per 100,000. Uh, and again, we're, uh, we have a, an expensive but not particularly safe uh, medical system, as we all know. All right, so John's talked about money and mistakes. So let's put that together. 
We're going to talk about quality improvement, patient safety, and the Affordable Care Act. So that's a mouthful, but we're going to break it down step by step. So what is quality improvement, or QI? It means different things to different people. And we thought it'd be a good idea to con compare and contrast two different models, a business model and a medicine model for quality improvement. So the ISO stands for the Organization for International Standardization. This group was formed in the 1940s to assist industries such as technology and engineering and manufacturing to make sure that they produce products and services that are of um, good quality, they're reliable, and they're safe. So if you actually get an ISO stamp of approval in the business world, that means you're doing things right. With regards to the medicine model, we decided, well, let's look at the Institute of Medicine, who's done a lot of research on med or healthcare quality improvement. And as you can see, this definition's pretty brief. The extent to which health services provided to individuals and patient populations improve desired healthcare outcomes. But it doesn't stop there. The IOM considers patient safety to be indistinguishable from the delivery of quality health care. And in fact, patient safety is the cornerstone for high quality health care. And in the past, when we've looked at patient safety and preventable harm, we've tended to focus on negative outcomes like morbidity and mortality, or the five Ds, death, disability, diseases, discomfort, and dissatisfaction. And yes, patient satisfaction is a quality measure. So I'm going to show you this next slide, which kind of ties it together. You see these headlines all too often, where there's a wrong side surgery or a medical mistake. And in the old days, and even nowadays, um, people will look at these and think, wow, somebody's head's going to roll. There's a mistake. Let's fire who did that. Well, that's quality assurance. But we've moved into an era of quality improvement, where we realize that when a mistake like this happens, it's not because of one individual. There may have been a dozen or more steps along the way where someone or something could have prevented this from happening. So we talk about patient safety and what are our definitions. I think when I was in PA school, I considered a patient safety that I would not write the wrong prescription or have a, a medication error, but it's much more broad and encompassing than that. So while healthcare has become more effective, it's also become more complex with greater and newer technologies and medicines and treatments. That combined with treating older and sicker patients that have significant comorbidities leads us to more challenging decision making and healthcare priorities. That with increasing economic pressures on health systems often leads to an overloaded healthcare environment. Therefore, we have unexpected and unwanted events that can take place in any area of healthcare delivery. Nowhere is this probably showcased any better than in the 1999 report from the Institute of Medicine to Air is Human. This report revealed that anywhere from 44 to 98,000 preventable deaths occurred every year in our nation's hospitals. All of these, again, preventable. So it showcased that healthcare in the U.S. is not as safe as it should be or as safe as it can be. The 2001 follow-up report titled Crossing the Quality Chasm focused more broadly on how the U.S. healthcare system can be reinvented to foster innovation and improve the delivery of care. We know that healthcare delivery system does not provide consistent, high-quality care to all Americans and that indeed healthcare does tend to harm more patients and we don't even deliver the care that we're capable of delivering. So as a result of this report, the committee presents a comprehensive strategy and an action plan for the coming decade, including, let me go back, to the six aims for improvement. That healthcare should be safe, effective, patient-centered, efficient, timely, and equitable. So fast forward to the next decade, and we have the Patient Protection and Affordable Care Act, which we refer to fondly as the ACA. So the ACA includes reforms at improving health care outcomes and streamlining the delivery of health care. And as a result of the ACA, we now have the National Quality on Strategy. And in that, we have the triple aim. Maybe some of you have heard of the triple aim. Better care. We want to improve the overall care to patients in our health care system. Healthier people, healthier populations and communities. So the ACA has embedded in it measures for prevention and population health, including addressing behavioral, social, and environmental determinants of health. And then finally, affordable care. 
We want to reduce the cost of quality health care for individuals, families, employers, and government agencies. So why should we care about this? Because this affects our reimbursement and how we get paid. And I know many of you out there are practicing providers out in the trenches. Uh, John and I are in academia. We don't do a lot of clinical medicine now, but prior to academia, John worked in family practice and I worked in internal medicine. And in the past, we've had an, basically a volume-driven system, kind of like a hotel and a hospital. You're rewarded for the number of beds that you have occupied. Well, the ACA is moving us more to a value-based purchasing system, which links provider payments to improve performance outcomes. It holds providers accountable for not only the quality of care that we give, but also holding that cost down. And then the goal is to reduce inappropriate care and identify and reward the best performing providers. As part of the ACA, the Secretary for Health and Human Services was required to develop a physician compare website which includes healthcare providers such as PAs. Formerly, this was known as PQRI, or the Physician Quality Reporting Initiative. Now it's referred to as PQRS. Many of you probably participate in this in your practices. Also, the outcomes that we're collecting, the data, is now implemented in a public reporting system that uses this information so that the public can compare outcomes for providers and for hospitals and institutions. So if you haven't read, the, read sorry, the entire ACA document, it's pretty lengthy. So John and I decided to highlight just a few aspects of this that maybe bring the point home for us. So Title III is improving the quality and efficiency of health care. And Part One specifically, is titled Linking Payment to Quality Outcomes Under the Medicare Program. So each of these sections highlights a change in reimbursement strategies. When the ACA rolled out, and a lot of this was voluntary, you could receive incentive payments for participating. So once it's mandatory, you'll have a penalty on your reimbursement for not participating or for not meeting these benchmarks or standards. So it's either incentive or a reduction in reimbursement. So we have ha um, hospital-based value purchasing. We have improvements to the physician quality reporting incentive. We now have quality reporting in long-term care facilities, skilled nursing, hospice, and inpatient psych. So we may be following things such as falls, pressure ulcers. We have value-based purchasing in the skilled nursings, now home health, and ambulatory surgical centers. We have value-based patient modifiers under the physician fee schedule. And we now have patient adjustments for conditions acquired in the hospital, such as catheter-associated UTIs, ventilator-associated pneumonias, events that shouldn't happen in our care. To give you an example of this, um, so let's say you have a patient in the hospital you're caring for, they come in for a hip replacement. Uh, they have a catheter placed, it's not removed at the right time, the patient develops a catheter-associated UTI, well, you won't be reimbursed for the care associated with that UTI, which, surprisingly to me, I don't work in the hospital, but can run into the tens of thousands of dollars. And then finally, we have the Hospital Readmission Reduction Program. Those of you who work in the hospital setting probably have a really good understanding of this. There's some diagnosis, such as acute myocardial infarction treatment, heart failure, and pneumonia that if your patient's discharged and return to the hospital within 30 days with the same diagnosis, you may not be reimbursed for all that care. So it's not all gloom and doom, though. Really, this is good news. The ACA and health care reform has a big place for physician assistance. And this article was published last September in JAPA, and it kind of highlights our role in this arena. We know there's a shortage of physician providers, but because there's such a pressure on these quality measures and outcome data, PAs have a role to fill in that. Our hospital PA friends and our procedure-based PA friends, they really have a lot of pressure put on them to make sure that they have outcomes that are high, of high standard, I guess, and so we should have a lot of support from our administrators. And then finally, across all care settings, PAs can play a crucial role in patient satisfaction. And I think we all know as PAs, our patients really like us, and we do contribute to patient satisfaction. So with that, we'll let John talk about recertification. Thanks, Joyce. So I, before I get going on this, I want to mention that uh, you know, the ACA will be essentially fully implemented in 2014, and that includes uh, the, the insurance exchanges being up and running. Um, and that is the pace of 
implementation of the ACA has been breathtaking. And I still think PAs, physicians, and, and all providers are just sort of catching their breath and trying to catch up. Uh, if you're interested in a little more about the ACA and how it impacts you, I highly recommend that you attend um, Dr. Uh, Dion Kidd's talk in this room at 11. He does an exceptional job of bringing the ACA to you and how it affects you and what's going on uh, currently with the ACA. So stick around at 11, it's a fantastic talk. So I wanna talk a little bit about recertification in the QI era because the NCCPA changes um, are, are directly um, tied into QI and di really directly tied in with the changes that the ACA mandates. Uh, I'm just curious, how many of you attended the NCCPA talk on recertification? So, so some folks were there. It was a very incredibly well attended and, and vocal uh, audience uh, from what I hear. So, um, so recertification in the QI era. I'm gonna go through this quickly. This information is all out there for you to discover, but it does tie in with our topic here. So there's a new NCCPA recertification process and it launches in, it also launches in 2014. And the, the changes, there's more detail to this, but I'm gonna give you just a skeleton outline. The changes are that we are going from a six year to a 10 year pan recycle. So that's a great thing. You're, you will be, starting in 2014, you'll be taking the pan re every 10 years. We are now based, our six year cycle is based on two year CME cycles, as you know. So every two years, you're required to earn 100 hours of CME, 50 of which needs to be category one, and the other 50 is category two. We will still have two year cycles. There will be five of them instead of three, thus the 10 years. The difference though, the thing that you really will really feel and notice is that of the category one CME, 20 hours in every two year, 100 hour cycle, 20 hours of category one CME will be either of these two types of new CME. So there is self-assessment CME, which I'll, I'll mention briefly, and then um, performance improvement or PI CME, which I'll go into in a little more detail because it's directly, it's a direct spinoff of quality improvement uh, ideas. Um, and so you will do the four cycles uh, of this new sort of CME, and then the fifth cycle will look very much like what we, it, well, it's identical to what we do now. So this is the NCCPA's um, graphic that's on their website, um, and basically it, it uh, shows the 10 year, um, five, two year cycles, and that yellow fifth cycle is the normal CME that you get by doing things like this, or doing um, journals or online CME. The, um, the other cycles will include that, so 30 out of the 50, category one each year, will be this sort of thing, um, but the other 20 are the ones that we're gonna talk about. So, self-assessment CME, again, I'm not gonna talk about this in great detail, but I will say that it is, it, it's similar to what you're doing here, um, it's, it's similar to online CME and journal-based journal CME, however, um, it involves uh, feedback. So you would take a, um, an assessment, for example, a pre-assessment, do some kind of a CME, uh, and then get feedback on your knowledge or skills based on that. So it's kind of like conventional CME with a little extra feedback thrown in. It's not uh, as, as confusing and doesn't feel as daunting as the PI CME. We'll talk about that in a sec. The, there's an example of um, self-assessment modules that are already out there. The American College of Physicians uh, has their MKSAT modules. Um, there's a whole slew of these modules based on, they're, they're um, based by topic. Uh, so there's a, a cardiology module, et cetera. Um, and there will be more of these and, and um, AAPA is in the process of developing these four PAs. <clears throat> So PICME, so PICME is performance improvement CME. Uh, this is an active process, so this is gonna feel a lot different. Um, this involves clinically practicing PAs and looking at your own practice. The, um, so the way it works is you, it's a three-step process. Uh, you basically compare some as aspect of your practice, for example, uh, hypertension control. So you look at hypertension control and how well you're doing that, and you compare your numbers at your practice to national benchmarks, performance guidelines, or other metrics. Uh, then you develop and implement a plan for improvement in, for your hypertension control, for example. Uh, then you uh, implement your plan, 
and evaluate your plan to see whether you have brought um, your hypertension control closer to those benchmarks, for example. <clears throat> so here are um, two examples of modules that are out there. Uh, AAPA um, is develop in conjunction with PAEA is developing other modules as well. Um, so the uh, American Academy of Family Physicians has their metric program. Uh, the AFP has been doing this uh, for several years now. These are already developed and out there. There's 10 of them. They tend to rotate the topics. Um, and each of these modules offers up to 20 hours of CME, and per hour of CME is very cost effective, $25. Um, and you don't need to be an AAFP member to use these. Um, the AAP, Pediatrics, has equip modules. They're very similar in structure to the metric modules. <clears throat> so here's an example. So if you are going to do PICME, um, and let's say you're interested in looking at your practice's performance in the area of hypertension control, you would uh, buy this module, and it's web-based. Uh, you basically log on whenever you need to use it. And then the module, the web-based module, really takes you through the entire process. I've done it. It's very intuitive. Uh, and it's actually easier than it sounds. Um, so the first step is practice assessment. It's an online questionnaire about your practice uh, that you fill out. Uh, and then um, the, the software helps you to evaluate your practice. Then you review patient charts. And here's the, th the thing that's a little bit of a relief it was to me when I first saw it. The ends on these things, the number needed, are very small. So for hy the hypertension module, you need 10 charts. This is not a, a massive, exhaustive look or exhausting look at your practice. Um, then you review those charts. You create an action plan. We'll talk about how to do that in a minute. <clears throat> and you decide what, you, what intervention you want to do in your practice. You do it. You implement your, your change. And then you reevaluate patient charts. It's typically one to five or six months after. Uh, the metric module won't even let you log back in for one month. They sort of force you to do your, to do your due diligence and at least l give a month uh, uh, of time for these uh, changes to take place. Then at some point, um, at the end point, you evaluate um, through the same process where you initially evaluated those charts. You reevaluate them and see if you've made any improvement. And here's an important part of this. You don't need to actually show improvement. Because if that were the case, you might have to do multiple of these before you got improvement in your practice. The idea is that this is to get you used to the quality improvement cycle and to, for you to start thinking this way in your practice. And hope, hopefully you will see improvement and perhaps implement some of this across your practice, but that's not required. You just have to complete the module, success or no success. <clears throat> Yeah, it was, yeah. Okay. so $25. Yeah. Okay, so putting pra quality improvement into practice. So before we go on, I just want a little show of hands. How many of you are currently working in a quality improvement or performance improvement project in your practices? That's great. That's a lot more than I would have I guessed. That's wonderful. So maybe we'll have some feedback here at the end. Okay, so you might wonder, well, let me go back a slide. So one question that we posed to our PA faculty friends with graduating new grads and now I want to pose to you, ask yourself these three questions. So are practicing PAs prepared to implement and follow quality improvement practices? Are PAs willing and able to be QI and patient safety knowledge experts in their individual practice settings? And are PAs well positioned to become leaders in their organization for quality improvement? And I must say that as a clinical site coordinator, which means I do a lot of windshield time. I'm out there in the field doing site visits on students and meeting with preceptors. And thank you, by the way, to all of you who take students. We could not do this without you. So hats off to you. But I have some friends out there that have been practicing for years. And one of a good friend of mine is an orthopedic PA in a large hospital in Colorado. I met with him about six months ago and asked him how life was going. And he said, you know, Joyce, the hospital leadership team wants me to lead the quality improvement amongst the advanced practice, you know, the NPs and the PAs. And he said, I just don't even know where to begin. And so I sent him to some resources that, that I used when I worked for the quality improvement organization. So about six months later, I saw Fred when I was back on a site visit. And I said, hey, how's it going in the quality improvement arena? He said, you know what? I really like this. 
I really do like this. I meet people that I normally wouldn't interact with at the hospital, and it's actually given him an elevated sense of job satisfaction. So while he dreaded it at the beginning, it ended up being a really good addition to his responsibilities. So I hope that you guys will take that challenge it offered to you. So where do you begin? Well, we recommend two places, and one of them being the Institute for Healthcare Improvement. How many of you are familiar with the IHI? Okay, well we wanna spread that today. And I'm not affiliated with the IHI, I don't get paid by the IHI. So we're gonna discuss the IHI Open School for Health Professions, and then we're gonna discuss the model for improvement. So, the IHI is a nonprofit organization whose mission is to improve healthcare across all settings from home to hospital. I think it was formed in the 1990s, and Don Berwick, the former director of um, CMS was actually president at the IHI. So anyway, they have an interprofessional education program called the Open School. And this format is being delivered all across the country. Every week when I get my IHI newsletter, there's the additional 10, 15 MD schools, DO, PA, nurse practitioner that are requiring their students to go through this or their faculty. It's open to anyone though so even if you're not in a faculty situation and you just want to get your team together at your clinic and sign up you can sign up for the open school and you can complete these modules together now one perk of being faculty and maybe even adjunct i'm not sure you can contact the ihi is that you can complete these modules at no at no charge so i've listed this screenshot of the 16 required modules and they're broken up into quality improvement patient safety patient-centered care and leadership and i've completed all 16 of those and you get cme credit so that's a nice part and it, each module takes about two to three hours to complete um, our medical students our second year medical students are required to complete the entire open certificate we require just two modules at this point because our curriculum in PA school is already packed and they won't let us take out things like EKG interpretation to put quality improvement in. But I'm arguing for that actually. So next, let's talk about the model for improvement. So this is a very simple tool, yet it's very powerful for accelerating change in the real work setting. So what we'll do is we'll break this down into two steps. And one thing I wanna share with you is that while this is used in quality improvement across all industries, automotive, building widgets, healthcare, you can also use this in your own personal life. So my husband and I show horses, we, we sort cattle uh, competitively, we're ranch sorters, and we used to win a lot, belt buckles, saddles, and money, and we quit winning. And I said, let's do a model for improvement and figure out why we're not winning anymore. And he kind of laughed at me at first, but it did work out. We went through more training, you get the, you know, you get the message, I guess. It works in any setting. So let's go through how to fill in the model for improvement. Step one, you gotta figure out what you wanna accomplish. You gotta set an aim. And it must be time specific and measurable and should define the specific population. So let's say you work in an urgent care setting and you wanna reduce the time that your patients wait to see a provider. On average, it's over an hour. But you hope to reduce that to less than 30 minutes and you wanna do that over a nine month period. It's time specific time specific and it's quantitative. So how will you know that a change is an improvement? Well, you have to be able to measure it. There's two ways to do measure, well, there's more than two, but common ways are outcome measures or process measures. So an outcome measure may be, you could take the patients in your diabetes registry and say, we wanna improve the percentage of patients whose A1C is above 8.0, we wanna bring that down to less than 8.0. That's what my CMS target was when I worked for the quality improvement organization. That's an outcome measure. A process measure may be, you can take those same patients and say, you know what, we wanna make sure that these patients are having an A1C drawn two times a year. We don't really care what the A1C level is, we just wanna make sure we're capturing that data. So that's a process measure. Then the third part is what changes can we make that will result in an improvement? This is the fun part where you get to get together as your team and form it. You may have someone from the C-suite. You could have um, your office manager, a physician champion. You form a team, but it's important that your team is inclusive of really just about everyone in your group at all levels, from the receptionist back to the 
to your end of the clinic, okay? And you can borrow, air, uh, borrow experiences from others. Like go on the HRSA website. There are quality improvement stories from all over the country, successful ones. So then we go to the second half of the model for improvement, and that is called the Plan, Do, Study, Act, or the PDSA cycle. Maybe some of you have heard of the PDSA. What this does is it helps you, sorry, accelerate your change. You wanna take a small, like John mentioned, a small set of patients, and you wanna test it on a small scale. We've made this mistake in PA education, I'll tell you. I used to set out evaluations to my preceptors or my students, and I would change them, carte blanche, and send them out to everybody, and then realize I spent all this time on these evaluations, and they weren't very good. So the idea here is to plan what you want to do, test it, study it, and act on the mistakes you've made or how you can improve it. So, sorry, I'm getting here the wrong way. There we go. So one of the clinics I worked with when I was at the QIO decided they were going to do medication reconciliation. They wanted to improve that metric. So they tested it in their pharmacy that was connected to the clinic, and they took a small number of patients that they knew had, had follow-up appointments in 30 to 60 days. They handed them brown paper bags and said, when you return to the clinic, please put all your medications in here and all your supplements and bring it back. What they discovered from that PDSA cycle is some of the patients, many of them didn't bring the bag back. It didn't have any instructions on it. So then they included instructions for the patients. And they did see an increase in the number of patients who returned the bag with the medications in it. But they didn't have the instructions in Spanish as well. So I think you kind of get where I'm going with this. Test it small, test it fast, and you can improve it and tweak it as you go along. So with that in mind, let's do a quality, a mock quality improvement project. So we're going to talk about the case of Peter, and this is a case, this is directly borrowed with permission from the IHI. So a good time to put in a plug for the IHI. Again, if you're not familiar with it, or even if you are, um, take a look, dig into some of, this, some of the things they have to offer. We, you know, again, the ACE, we are on the, the verge of the ACA being fully launched and, and the exchange is opening, and um, I think it's really, um, it's time to catch up on this stuff, and the IHI is a really nice way to get comfortable with these concepts. So the case of Peter. Peter's a patient with AFib uh, who is on warfarin, and he's seeing his cardiology PA. Peter goes to the clinic weekly to have his INR drawn. One week, he does not get a call with his blood work results, does not show up. Uh, and the following week, he is admitted to the hospital with a bleeding ulcer and an INR of 8. So what is the problem? So this is a classic case that may underscore a bigger, a wider problem in the, in the practice. So one way to go after this and, and to try to sort out what the problem is is a root cause analysis. And this is done across industry and in just about every sector. You can do a root cause analysis of your marriage if you want. Um, you, can, you can do it, not that I have, but you can. Um, <laughs> my marriage is perfect. So, um, Root cause analysis, the idea is that the problem is what you see. So this is the weed, the symptom. The real problem is, is in the roots, and to get to the root of the problem and to really do something about it, you have to dig. Uh, and there's several ways to do this. The one way I'm going to show you, and my favorite way to approach RCAs, is the ask why five times technique. It's very simple and intuitive. You have a problem, and you ask, you, you go five layers deep if you can. You may, not, you may get there in fewer than five whys. Um, so in our case, Peter was admitted with a bleeding ulcer. Why? His INR was high. Why? His warfarin dose was incorrect. Why? So you keep digging. He was not seen in a timely manner. Why? So I got to five whys. Uh, the patient was not notified of his abnormal INR. So um, a t your team or you or wh whomever are your patient safety folks, for example, in your practice, might conduct this root cause analysis. Um, one root cause that the team identified in this case uh, was that the cardiology clinic does not have a specific method to make sure that they reach all patients with INRs and communicate their results uh, and action plans uh, prop promptly. So then the, the team would come up with a plan. How, what are we going to do about this? And there are these four options. I won't read them all, but they're, they're basically things like assigning more staff or posting signs or making phone calls. 
Um, and if you're going to do this PDSA cycle, then you just pick one of these. You need to keep it simple. You don't want to confuse the issue and not know which of your interventions worked. You do these, you do them quickly, you evaluate, and you keep cycling. So the PDSA cycle and the model for improvement is iterative. It is meant to be something that you do quickly and you keep modifying and keep perfecting. Uh, so any one of these um, could have an impact, and it's a matter of implementing it and determining how you're going to measure it. Right, so the idea is, so the question is you make one change at a time, right? It's important that you don't do too much. So if you, if you said that all, all four of these things um, were, oops, all four of these changes were likely to be valuable, and they, pr they could all be, the importance of this cycle is that you don't do all four. You want to do one basic change so that you can so you don't muddle your results and and uh, end up unable to determine what which of the four changes had an effect. So it's actually important that you do one. So you might start with your favorite. It might be C. Work with the lab to automatically generate a list of patients, etc. And you would do that, and you would come up with a way to measure it, and then you see how you do. And if that helped a little, then you may decide you want to improve even more, and you may keep doing that. And then add A, assigning more staff to calling patients. Add that, and that's your next PDSA cycle. And the PDSA cycle is meant to be a cycle. It's meant to be iterative. You keep going, you make changes. But it is important not to make a lot of changes at once. You want to keep it really basic so you know what you're measuring. All right. So, um, so you know, the idea here is now to think about your own um, practices and your own QI projects. Um, this is a good model for doing this. The IHI can be very helpful. And I'll, I'll tell you, I'll say it again, I mentioned it earlier, with the launching of the, the full implementation of the Affordable Care Act in 2014, uh, this, is, this is going to need to be a necessary part of our practices. And I think that the ACA has really um, happened quickly, and it's it's um, taken us all by surprise at how quickly it's happened. Um, but we are all expected to be able to do this. And um, the the PI CME that we talked about a little earlier, I think is is part of that. I think it engenders that notion of, of um, incorporating uh, quality improvement into our own continual continuing medical education. Uh, but the um, the take home is that this is coming and it's coming quickly. And, um, so, and as John mentioned, uh, well, our physician colleagues are already doing this for their maintenance of certification. Oh, thanks. And, um, and as a quality improvement, uh, they called me a specialist. I don't think that was a great term for me. But anyway, I went out into practices. And what I found out is that most of us, when we get out of PA school and medical school and nurse practitioner school, we don't know much about this. And we just want to help you be able to walk the walk and talk the talk so that you're not caught off guard when asked to uh, implement this into your practice. So we'll share a few other resources. We use Team Steps with our students in interprofessional education. This is a communication tool, team-based communication tool for care transitions, safe handoffs. We also have used, well, at the QIO, we, we implemented Lean and Six Sigma methodologies. These are big businesses. You can attend these workshops. They're very expensive. Um, the Toyota Motor Company, I think, made Lean quite famous because um, it, it changed their whole manufacturing and production line to be successful. We have WHO, Patient Safety Resources. They're free. They have a great website that you can tap into. Don't forget, there's always patient safety videos on YouTube, and there's some really good ones from some of the educational associations. Risk management lectures. Your hospitals and institutions are a good resource for this. You can also talk to your um, malpractice providers in your state. You can do mock QI projects for fun at the IHI. And then I want to mention briefly, contact your local quality improvement organization. So a QIO is actually an official term. There are 53 QIOs in the United States, all 50 states, Puerto Rico, Virgin Islands, and that's who I work for. I worked for Colorado Foundation for Medical Care. And oh, back in the 60s or 70s, CMS was mandated by Congress to work with a quality improvement organization or a QIO 
in delivering care to our nation's beneficiaries. So you work, they work on scopes of work, three-year contracts with Medicare. It's a great source in your state. Contact the people in that, in all the different departments. They can help you with reducing adverse drug events, educating you on care transitions, reducing hospital acquired conditions. They're there to help us, and they are a free resource to you. And in fact, we welcome, when I worked at the QIO, we were looking for um, organizations that would volunteer to work with us. Uh, the key here is that the QIO can teach you how to do these things, but you have to keep it sustainable in your organization. Once they leave, you've got to be able to maintain this and spread the change amongst your organizations. So we'll leave you with one closing definition. What is a quality improvement project? And this definition comes from CMS. It's a set of related activities designed to achieve measurable improvement in processes and outcomes of care. Improvements are achieved through interventions that target healthcare providers, practitioners, plans, and or beneficiaries. Or put more simply, it's about doing the right thing the right way at the right time in the right amount for the right patient with no harm to the patient. This is really the impetus behind the ACA. And it's, this is where we all need to get quite quickly, actually. So um, I, I would encourage you all to look at some of these resources, um, to, to, be, um, to use the, the um, state-level resources that are available to you. Feel free to shoot us an email if you have um, questions. Um, Joyce, having worked for QIO, is very knowledgeable about that end of things. Um, but now is the time. It is upon us. So I want to definitely acknowledge the Institute for Healthcare Improvement who gave us permission to take borrow their slides and present them to you today. Um, one more resource that I didn't include, for those of you who work in long-term care or with geriatric population, you can go to Advancing Excellence is the name of the website, and it has wonderful, wonderful tools for QAPI, Quality Assurance and Performance Improvement, around uh, infections, pressure ulcers, the common things that you see in the health and the long-term care care setting. So with that, we'll take any questions if there are any. Advancing care, what was it? Advancing excellence. Well, thank you very much. And please fill out your evaluations for us for PAEA. We appreciate it. Thank you for your time.